History of England, Chapter Ten, Part Nine. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by John Leader, Bloomington, Illinois. History of England from the Accession of James the Second by Thomas Babington Macaulay, Chapter Ten, Part Nine. The opinion of Sancroft had great weight with the whole Tory party, and especially with the clergy. A week before the day for which the convention had been summoned, a grave party assembled at Lambeth Palace, heard prayers in the chapel, dined with the primate, and then consulted on the state of public affairs. Five suffragans of the archbishop, who had shared his perils and his glory in the preceding summer, were present. The earls of Clarendon, and Aylesbury represented the Tory laity. The unanimous sense of the meeting appeared to be that those who had taken the oath of allegiance of to James might justifiably withdraw their obedience from him, but could not, with a safe conscience, call any other by the name of king. Thus two sections of the Tory party, a section which looked forward to an accommodation with James, and a section which was opposed to any such accommodation, agreed in supporting the plan of regency. But a third section, which, though not very numerous, had great weight and influence, recommended a very different plan. The leaders of this small band were Danby and the Bishop of London in the House of Lords, and Sir Robert Sawyer in the House of Commons. They conceived that they had found out a way of effecting a complete revolution under strictly legal forms. It was contrary to all principle, they said, that the king should be deposed by his subjects. Nor was it necessary to depose him. He had himself, by his flight, abdicated his power and dignity. A demise had actually taken place. All constitutional lawyers held that the throne of England could not be one moment vacant. The next heir had therefore succeeded. Who, then, was the next heir? As to the infant who had been carried into France, his entrance into the world had been attended by many suspicious circumstances. It was due to the other members of the royal family and to the nation that all doubts should be cleared up. An investigation had been solemnly demanded, in the name of the Princess of Orange, by her husband, and would have been instituted if the parties who were accused of fraud had not taken a course which in any ordinary case, would have been considered as a decisive proof of guilt. They had not chosen to await the issue of a solemn parliamentary proceeding. They had stolen away into a foreign country. They had carried with them the child. They had carried with them all those French and Italian women of the bedchamber who, if there had been foul play, must have been privy to it, and who ought therefore to have been subjected to a rigorous cross-examination. To admit the boy's claim without inquiry was impossible, and those who called themselves his parents had made inquiry impossible. Judgment must therefore go against him by default. If he was wronged, he was wronged not by the nation, but by those whose strange conduct at the time of his birth had justified the nation in demanding investigation, and who had then avoided investigation by flight. He might, therefore, with perfect equity, be considered as a pretender. And thus the crown had legally devolved on the Princess of Orange. She was actually Queen Regnant. The houses had nothing to do but to proclaim her. She might, if such were her pleasure, make her husband her first minister, and might even, with the consent of Parliament, bestow on him the title of king. The persons who preferred this scheme to any other were few, and it was certain to be opposed both by all who still bore any good will to James, and by all the adherents of William. Yet Danby, confident in his own knowledge of parliamentary tactics, and well aware how much, when great parties are nearly balanced, a small flying squadron can effect, was not without hopes of being able to keep the event of the contest in suspense till both Whigs and Tories, despairing of complete victory, and afraid of the consequences of delay, should suffer him to act as umpire. Nor is it impossible that they might have succeeded if his efforts had been seconded, nay, if they had not been counteracted, by her whom he wished to raise to the height of human greatness. 
Quick-sighted as he was, and versed in affairs, he was altogether ignorant of the character of Mary, and of the feeling with which she regarded her husband. Nor was her old preceptor, Compton, better informed. William's manners were dry and cold, his constitution was infirm, and his temper by no means bland. He was not a man who would commonly be thought likely to inspire a fine young woman of twenty-six with a violent passion. It was known that he had not always been strictly constant to his wife, and tale-bearers had reported that she did not live happily with him. The most acute politicians, therefore, never suspected that, with all his faults, he had obtained such an empire over her heart as princes the most renowned for their success and gallantry, Francis I and Henry IV, Louis the Fourteenth and Charles the Second, had never obtained over the heart of any woman, and that the three kingdoms of her forefathers were valuable in her estimation chiefly because, by bestowing them on him, she could prove to him the intensity and disinterestedness of her affection. Danby, in profound ignorance of her sentiments, assured her that he would defend her rights, and that, if she would support him, he hoped to place her alone on the throne. The course of the Whigs, meanwhile, was simple and consistent. Their doctrine was that the foundation of our government was a contract expressed on one side by the oath of allegiance, and on the other by the coronation oath, and that the duties imposed by this contract were mutual. They held that a sovereign who grossly abused his power might lawfully be withstood and dethroned by his people. That James had grossly abused his power was not disputed, and the whole Whig party was ready to pronounce that he had forfeited it. Whether the Prince of Wales was supposititious was a point not worth discussing. There were now far stronger reasons than any which could be drawn from the circumstances of his birth for excluding him from the throne. A child, brought to the royal couch in a warming-pan, might possibly prove a good king of England. But there could be no such hope for a child, educated by a father who was the most stupid and obstinate of tyrants, in a foreign country, the seat of despotism and superstition, in a country where the last traces of liberty had disappeared, where the States General had ceased to meet, where Parliaments had long registered, without one remonstrance, the most oppressive edicts of the Sovereign, where valour, genius, learning, seemed to exist only for the purpose of aggrandizing a single man, where adulation was the main business of the press, the pulpit, and the stage, and where one chief subject of adulation was the barbarous persecution of the Reformed Church. Was the boy likely to learn under such tuition and in such a situation respect for the institutions of his native land? Could it be doubted that he would be brought up to be the slave of the Jesuits and the Bourbons, and that he would be, if possible, more bitterly prejudiced than any preceding Stuart against the laws of England? Nor did the Whigs think that, situated as the country then was, a departure from the ordinary rule of succession was in itself an evil. They were of the opinion that, till the rule had been broken, the doctrines of indefeasible hereditary right and passive obedience would be pleasing to the court, would be inculcated by the clergy, and would retain a strong hold on the public mind. The notion would still prevail that the kingly office is the ordinance of God in a sense different from that in which all government is his ordinance. It was plain that, till this superstition was extinct, the Constitution could never be secure. For a really limited monarchy cannot long exist in a society which regards monarchy as something divine and the limitations as mere human inventions. Royalty, in order that it might exist in perfect harmony with our liberties, must be unable to show any higher or more venerable title than that by which we hold our liberties. The king must be henceforth regarded as a magistrate, a great magistrate indeed, and highly to be honoured, but subject, like all other magistrates, to the law, and deriving his power from heaven in no other sense than that in which the lords and the commons may be said to derive their power from heaven. The best way of effecting this salutary change would be to interrupt the course of dissent. Under sovereigns who would consider it as little short of high treason to preach non-resistance and the patriarchal theory of government, 
under sovereigns whose authority, springing from resolutions of the two houses, could never rise higher than its source, there would be little risk of oppression such as had compelled two generations of Englishmen to rise in arms against two generations of Stuarts. On these grounds the Whigs were prepared to declare the throne vacant, to fill it by election, and to impose on the prince of their choice such conditions as might secure the country against misgovernment. The time for the decision of these great questions had now arrived. At break of day, on the 22nd of January, the House of Commons was crowded with knights and burgesses. On the benches appeared many faces which had been well known in that place during the reign of Charles the Second, but had not been seen there under his successor. Most of those Tory squires, and of those needy retainers of the court, who had been returned in multitudes to the Parliament of 1685, had given place to the men of the old country party, the men who had driven the cabal from power, who had carried the Habeas Corpus Act, and who had sent up the Exclusion Bill to the Lords. Among them was Powell, deeply read in the history and law of Parliament, and distinguished by the species of eloquence which is required when grave questions are to be solemnly brought under the notice of senates. And Sir Thomas Littleton, versed in European politics, and gifted with a vehement and piercing logic which had often, when, after a long sitting, the candles had been lighted, roused the languishing house, and decided the event of the debate. There, too, was William Shechevrel, an orator whose great parliamentary abilities were, many years later, a favorite theme of old men who lived to see the conflicts of Walpole and Pulteney. With these eminent persons was joined Sir Robert Clayton, the wealthiest merchant of London, whose palace in the old Jewry surpassed in splendor the aristocratical mansions of Lincoln's Inn Fields and Covent Garden, whose villa among the Surrey Hills was described as a Garden of Eden, whose banquets vied with those of kings, and whose judicious munificence, still attested by numerous public monuments, had obtained for him in the annals of the city a place second only to that of Gresham. In the Parliament which met at Oxford in 1681, Clayton had, as member for the capital, and at the request of his constituents, moved for leave to bring in the Bill of Exclusion, and had been seconded by Lord Russell. In 1685, the city, deprived of its franchises, and governed by the creatures of the court, had returned four Tory representatives. But the old charter had now been restored, and Clayton had been again chosen by acclamation. Nor must John Birch be passed over. He had begun life as a carter, but had, in the civil wars, left his team, had turned soldier, had risen to the rank of colonel in the army of the Commonwealth, had, in high fiscal offices, shown great talents for business, had sate many years in Parliament, and, though retaining to the last the rough manners and plebeian dialect of his youth, had, by strong sense and mother wit, gained the ear of the commons, and was regarded as a formidable opponent by the most accomplished debaters of his time. These were the most conspicuous among the veterans who now, after a long seclusion, returned to public life but they were all speedily thrown into the shade by two younger Whigs, who, on this great day, took their seats for the first time, who soon rose to the highest honors of the state, who weathered together the fiercest storms of faction, and who, having been long and widely renowned as statesmen, as orators, and as munificent patrons of genius and learning, died within a few months of each other, soon after the accession of the House of Brunswick. These were Charles Montague and John Summers. One other name must be mentioned, a name then known only to a small circle of philosophers, but now pronounced beyond the Ganges and the Mississippi, with reverence exceeding that which is paid to the memory of the greatest warriors and rulers. Among the crowd of silent members appeared the majestic forehead and pensive face of Isaac Newton. The renowned university on which his genius had already begun to impress a peculiar character, still plainly discernible after the lapse of a hundred and sixty years, had sent him to the convention, and he sate there, in his modest greatness, 
the unobtrusive but unflinching friend of civil and religious freedom. The first act of the Commons was to choose a speaker, and the choice which they made indicated in a manner not to be mistaken their opinion touching the great questions which they were about to decide. Down to the very eve of the meeting it had been understood that Seymour would be placed in the chair. He had formerly sat there during several years. He had great and various titles to consideration. Descent, fortune, knowledge, experience, eloquence. He had long been at the head of a powerful band of members of the western counties. Though a Tory, he had in the last Parliament headed, with conspicuous ability and courage, the opposition to popery and arbitrary power. He had been among the first gentlemen who had repaired to the Dutch headquarters at Exeter, and had been the author of that association by which the Prince's adherents had bound themselves to stand or fall together. But a few hours before the Houses met, a rumour was spread that Seymour was against declaring the throne vacant. As soon, therefore, as the benches had filled, the Earl of Wiltshire, who represented Hampshire, stood up and proposed that Powell should be Speaker. Sir Vere Fane, member for Kent, seconded the motion. A plausible objection might have been raised, for it was known that a petition was about to be presented against Powell's return, but the general cry of the House called him to the chair, and the Tories thought it prudent to acquiesce. The mace was then laid on the table, the list of members was called over, and the names of the defaulters were noted. Meanwhile, the peers, about a hundred in number, had met, had chosen Halifax to be their speaker, and had appointed several eminent lawyers to perform the functions which, in regular parliaments, belonged to the judges. There was, in the course of that day, frequent communication between the houses. They joined in requesting that the prince would continue to administer the government till he should hear further from them, in expressing to him their gratitude for the deliverance which he, under God, had wrought for the nation, and in directing that the 31st of January should be observed as a day of thanksgiving for that deliverance. Thus far, no difference of opinion had appeared, but both sides were preparing for the conflict. The Tories were strong in the upper house and weak in the lower, and they knew that, at such a conjuncture, the house which should be the first to come to a resolution would have a great advantage over the other. There was not the least chance that the Commons would send up to the Lords a vote in favour of the plan of Regency, but, if such a vote were sent down from the Lords to the Commons, it was not absolutely impossible that many even of the Whig representatives of the people might be disposed to acquiesce, rather than take the grave responsibility of causing discord and delay at a crisis which required union and expedition. The Commons had determined that, on Monday, the 28th of January, they would take into consideration the state of the nation. The Tory lords, therefore, proposed, on Friday the 25th, to enter instantly on the great business for which they had been called together. But their motives were clearly discerned, and their tactics frustrated by Halifax, who, ever since his return from Hungerford, had seen that the settlement of the government could be effected on Whig principles only, and who had, therefore, for the time, allied himself closely with the Whigs. Devonshire moved that Tuesday the twenty-ninth should be the day. By that time, he said with more truth than discretion, we may have some lights from below, which may be useful for our guidance. His motion was carried, but his language was severely censured by some of his brother peers as derogatory to their order. End of Part 9England, chapter 10, part 10. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gemma Blythe. History of England from the Accession of James the Second by Thomas Babington Macaulay. Chapter 10, part 10. On the 28th, the Commons resolved themselves into a committee of the whole house, a member who had, more than thirty years before, been one of the Cromwell's lords, Richard Hamden, 
son of the illustrious leader of the roundheads and father of the unhappy man who had by large bribes and degrading submissions narrowly escaped with life from the vengeance of james was placed in the chair and the great debate began it was soon evident that an overwhelming majority considered james as no longer king gilbert dolben son of the late archbishop of york was the first who declared himself to be of that opinion he was supported by many members particularly by the bold and vehement wharton by sawyer whose steady opposition to the dispensing power had in some measure atoned for old offences by maynard whose voice though so feeble with age that it could not be heard on distant benches still commanded the respect of all parties and by summers whose luminous eloquence and varied stores of knowledge were on that day exhibited for the first time within the walls of parliament the unblushing forehead and voluble tongue of sir william williams were found on the same side already he had been deeply concerned in the excesses both of the worst of oppositions and the worst of governments he had persecuted innocent papists and innocent protestants he had been the patron of oates and the tool of petrie his name was associated with seditious violence which was remembered with regret and shame by all respectable whigs and with freaks of despotism abhorred by all respectable tories how men live under such infamy it is not easy to understand but even such infamy was not enough for williams he was not ashamed to attack the fallen master to whom he had hired himself out for work which no honest man in the inns of court would undertake and from whom he had within six months accepted a baronetcy as the reward of civility only three members ventured to oppose themselves to what was evidently the general sense of the assembly sir christopher musgrave a tory gentleman of great weight and ability hinted some doubts heneage finch let fall some expressions which were understood to mean that he wished a negotiation to be opened with the king this suggestion was so ill received that he made haste to explain it away he protested that he had been misapprehended he was convinced that under such a prince there could be no security for religion liberty or property to recall king james or to treat with him would be a fatal course but many who would never consent that he should exercise the regal power had conscientious scruples about depriving him of the royal title there was one expedient which would remove all difficulties a regency this proposition found so little favour that finch did not venture to demand a division richard fanshaw viscount fanshaw of the kingdom of ireland said a few words in behalf of james and recommended an adjournment but the recommendation was met by a general outcry member after member stood up to represent the importance of dispatch every moment it was said was precious the public anxiety was intense trade was suspended the minority sullenly submitted and suffered the predominant party to take its own course what that course would be was not perfectly clear for the majority was made up of two classes one class consisted of eager and vehement whigs who if they had been able to take their own course would have given to the proceedings of the convention a decidedly revolutionary character the other class admitted that a revolution was necessary but regarded it as a necessary evil and wished to disguise it as much as possible under the show of legitimacy the former class demanded a distinct recognition of the right of subjects to dethrone bad princes the latter class desired to rid the country of one bad prince without promulgating any doctrine which might be abused for the purpose of weakening the just and salutary authority of future monarchs the former class dwelt chiefly on the king's misgovernment the latter on his flight the former class considered him as having forfeited his crown the latter as having resigned it it was not easy to draw up any form of words which would please all whose assent it was important to obtain but at length out of many suggestions offered from different quarters a resolution was framed which gave general satisfaction it would move that king james the second having endeavoured to subvert the constitution of the kingdom by breaking the original contract between king and people and by the advice of jesuits and other wicked persons 
having violated the fundamental laws and having withdrawn himself out of the kingdom, had abdicated the government, and that the throne had thereby become vacant. This resolution has been many times objected to criticism, as minute and severe as was ever applied to any sentence written by man, and perhaps there never was a sentence written by man which would bear such criticism less, that a king, by grossly abusing his power, may forfeit, it is true, that a king who absconds without making any provision for the administration, and leaves his people in a state of anarchy, may, without any violent straining of language, be said to have abdicated his functions, is also true, but no accurate writer, would affirm that long-continued misgovernment and desertion, added together, make up an act of abdication. It is evident, too, that the mention of the Jesuits and other evil advisers of James weakens instead of strengthening the case against him, for surely more indulgence is due to a man misled by pernicious counsel than to a man who goes wrong from the mere impulse of his own mind. It is idle, however, to examine these memorable words as we should examine a chapter of aristotle or of hobbes such words ought to be considered not as words but as deeds if they effect that which they are intended to effect they are rational though they may be contradictory if they fail of attending their end they are absurd though they carry demonstration with them logic admits of no compromise the essence of politics is compromise it is therefore not strange that some of the most important and most useful political instruments in the world should be among the most illogical compositions that ever were penned. The object of Summers, of Maynard, and of the other eminent men who shaped the celebrated motion was not to leave to posterity a model of definition and partition, but to make the restoration of a tyrant impossible, and to place on the throne a sovereign under whom law and liberty might be secure. This object they attained by using language which, in a philosophical treatise, would justly be reprehended as inexact and confused. They cared little whether their major agreed with their conclusion, if the major secured two hundred votes and the conclusion two hundred more. In fact, the one beauty of the resolution is its inconsistency. There was a phrase for every subdivision of the majority. The mention of the original contract gratified the disciples of Sydney. The word abdication conciliated politicians of a more timid school. There were doubtless many fervent Protestants who were pleased with the censure cast on the Jesuits. To the real statesmen the single important clause was that which declared the throne vacant, and if that clause could be carried, he cared little by what preamble it might be introduced. The force which was thus united made all resistance hopeless. The motion was adopted by the committee without a division. It was ordered that the report should be instantly made. Powell returned to the chair. The mace was laid on the table. Hampton brought up the resolution. The House instantly agreed to it and ordered him to carry it to the Lords. On the following morning the Lords assembled early. The benches both of the spiritual and of the temporal peers were crowded. Hampton appeared at the bar, and put the resolution of the Commons into the hands of Halifax. The upper house then resolved itself into a committee, and Danby took the chair. The discussion was soon interrupted by the reappearance of Hampton with another message. The house resumed, and was informed that the Commons had just voted it inconsistent with the safety and welfare of this Protestant nation to be governed by a Popish king. To this resolution, irreconcilable as it obviously was with the doctrine of indefeasible hereditary right, the peers gave an immediate and unanimous assent. The principle which was thus affirmed has always, down to our own time, been held sacred by all Protestant statesmen, and has never been considered by any reasonable Roman Catholic as objectionable. If indeed our sovereigns were, like the presidents of the United States, mere civil functionaries, it would not be easy to vindicate such a restriction. But the headship of the English church is annexed to the English crown, and there is no intolerance in saying that a church ought not to be subjected to a head who regards her as schismatical and heretical. After this short interlude, the lords again went into committee. 
the tories insisted that their plan should be discussed before the vote of the commons which declared the throne vacant was considered this was conceded to them and the question was put whether a regency exercising kingly power during the life of james in his name would be the best expedient for preserving the laws and liberties of the nation the contest was long and animated the chief speakers in favour of a regency were rochester and nottingham halifax and danby led the other side the primate strange to say did not make his appearance though earnestly importuned by the tory peers to place himself at their head his absence drew on in many contumelious censures nor have even his eulogists been able to find any explanation of it which raises his character the plan of regency was his own he had a few days before in a paper written with his own hand pronounced that plan to be clearly the best that could be adopted the deliberations of the lords who supported that plan had been carried on under his roof his situation made it his clear duty to declare publicly what he thought nobody can suspect him of personal cowardice or of vulgar cupidity it was probably from a nervous fear of doing wrong that at this great conjuncture he did nothing but he should have known that situated as he was to do nothing was to do wrong a man who was too scrupulous to take on himself a grave responsibility at an important crisis ought to be too scrupulous to accept the place of first minister of the church and first peer of the realm it is not strange however that sandcroft's mind should have been ill at case for he could hardly be blind to the obvious truth that the scheme which he had recommended to his friends was utterly inconsistent with all that he and his brethren had been teaching during many years that the king had a divine and indefeasible right to the regal power and that the regal power even when most grossly abused could not without sin be resisted was the doctrine in which the anglican church had long gloried did this doctrine then really mean only that the king had a divine and indefeasible right to have his effigy and name cut on a seal which was to be daily employed in despite of him for the purpose of commissioning his enemies to levy war on him and of sending his friends to the gallows for obeying him did the whole duty of a good subject consist in using the word king if so fairfax at naseby and bradshaw in the high court of justice had performed all the duty of good subjects for charles had been designated by the generals who commanded against him and even by the judges who condemned him as king nothing in the conduct of the long parliament had been more severely blamed by the church than the ingenious device of using the name of charles against himself every one of her ministers had been required to sign a declaration condemning as traitorous the fiction by which the authority of the sovereign had been separated from his person yet this traitorous fiction was now considered by the primate and by many of his africans as the only basis on which they could in strict conformity with christian principles erect a government the distinction which sancroft had borrowed from the roundheads of the preceding generation subverted from the foundation that system of politics which the church and the universities pretended to have learned from st paul the holy spirit it has been a thousand times repeated had commanded the romans to be subject to nero the meaning of the precept now appeared to be only that the romans were to be called nero augustus they were perfectly at liberty to chase him beyond the euphrates to leave him a pensioner on the bounty of the parthians to withstand him by force if he attempted to return to punish all who aided him or corresponded with him and to transfer the tribunitian power and the consular power the presidency of the senate and the command of the legions to garba or vespasian the analogy which the archbishop imagined that he had discovered between the case of a wrong-headed king and the case of a lunatic king will not bear a moment's examination it was plain that james was not in that state of mind in which if he had been a country gentleman or a merchant any tribunal would have held him incapable of executing a contract or a will he was of unsound mind only as all bad kings are of unsound mind as charles i had been of unsound mind when he went to seize the five members 
as Charles the Second had been of unsound mind when he concluded the Treaty of Dover. If this sort of mental unsoundness did not justify subjects in withdrawing their obedience from princes, the plan of a regency was evidently indefensible. If this sort of mental unsoundness did justify subjects in withdrawing their obedience from princes, the doctrine of non-resistance was completely given up, and all that any moderate Whig had ever contended for was fully admitted. As to the oath of allegiance about which Sancroft and his disciples were so anxious, one thing at least was clear, that whoever might be right, they were wrong. The Whigs held that, in the oath of allegiance, certain conditions were implied, that the king had violated these conditions, and that the oath had therefore lost its force. But, if the Whig doctrine were false, if the oath were still binding, could men of sense really believe that they escaped the guilt of perjury by voting for a regency? Could they affirm that they bore true allegiance to James while they were in defiance of his protestations made before all Europe, authorizing another person to receive the royal revenues, to summon and prorogue parliaments, to create dukes and earls, to name bishops and judges, to pardon offenders, to command the forces of the state, and to conclude treaties with foreign powers? Had Pascal been able to find in all the folios of the Jesuitical casuists, a sophism more contemptible than that which now, as it seemed, sufficed to quiet the consciences of the fathers of the Anglican Church. Nothing could be more evident than that the plan of regency could be defended only on Whig principles. Between the rational supporters of that plan and the majority of the House of Commons, there could be no dispute as to the question of right. All that remained was a question of expediency, and would any statesman seriously contend that it was expedient to constitute a government with two heads, and to give to one of those heads regal power without regal dignity, and to the other regal dignity without regal power? It was notorious that such an arrangement, even when made necessary by the infancy or insanity of a prince, had serious disadvantages that times of regency were times of weakness, of trouble, and of disaster. Was it truth proved by the whole history of England, of France, and of Scotland, and had almost become a proverb? Yet, in a case of infancy or of insanity, the king was at least passive. He could not actively counterwork the regent. What was now proposed was that England should have two first magistrate, of ripe age and sound mind, waging with each other an irreconcilable war. It was absurd to talk of leaving James merely the kingly name and depriving him of all the kingly power, for the name was a part of the power. The word king was a word of conjuration. It was associated in the minds of many Englishmen with the idea of a mysterious character derived from above, and in the minds of almost all Englishmen with the idea of legitimate and venerable authority. Surely, if the title carried with it such power, those who maintain that James ought to be deprived of all power could not deny that he ought to be deprived of the title. And how long was the anomalous government planned by the genius of Sancroft to last? Every argument which could be urged for setting it up at all might be urged with equal force for retaining it to the end of time. If the boy who had been carried into France was really born of the queen, he would hereafter inherit the divine and indefeasible right to be called king. The same right would very probably be transmitted from papist to papist through the whole of the eighteenth and nineteenth centuries. Both the houses had unanimously resolved that England should not be governed by a papist. It might well be, therefore, that from generation to generation regents would continue to administer the government in the name of vagrant and mendicant kings. There was no doubt that the regents must be appointed by Parliament. The effect, therefore, of this contrivance, a contrivance intended to preserve unimpaired the sacred principle of hereditary monarchy, would be that the monarchy would become really elective. Another unanswerable reason was urged against Sancroft's plan, there was in the statute book a law which had been passed soon after the close of the long and bloody contest between the houses of York and Lancaster, 
and which had been framed for the purpose of averting calamities such as the alternate victories of those houses had brought on the nobility and gentry of the realm by this law it was provided that no person should by adhering to a king in possession incur the penalties of treason when the regicides were brought to trial after the restoration some of them insisted that their case lay within the equity of this act they had obeyed they said the government which was in possession and were therefore not traitors the judges admitted that this would have been a good defence if the prisoners had acted under the authority of a usurper who like henry the fourth and richard the third bore the regal title but declared that such a defence could not avail men who had indicted sentenced and executed one who in the indictment in the sentence and in the death warrant was designated as king it followed therefore that whoever should support a regent in opposition to james would run great risk of being hanged drawn and quartered if ever james should recover supreme power but that no person could without such a violation of law as jeffreys himself would hardly venture to commit be punished for siding with a king who was reigning though wrongfully at whitehall against a rightful king who was in exile at saint germain it should seem that these arguments admit of no reply and that they were doubtless urged with force by danby who had a wonderful power of making every subject which he treated clear to the dullest mind and by halifax who in fertility of thought and brilliancy of diction had no rival among the orators of that age yet so numerous and powerful were the tories in the upper house that notwithstanding the weakness of their case the defection of their leader and the ability of their opponents they very nearly carried the day a hundred lords divided forty-nine voted for a regency fifty-one against it in the minority were the natural children of charles the brothers-in-law of james the dukes of somerset and ormond the archbishop of york and eleven bishops no prelate voted in the majority except compton and trelawney it was near nine in the evening before the house rose the following day was the thirtieth of january the anniversary of the death of charles the first the great body of the anglican clergy had during many years thought it a sacred duty to inculcate on that day the doctrines of non-resistance and passive obedience their old sermons were now of little use and many divines were even in doubt whether they could venture to read the whole liturgy the lower house had declared that the throne was vacant the upper had not yet expressed any opinion it was therefore not easy to decide whether the prayers for the sovereign ought to be used every officiating minister took his own course in most of the churches of the capital the petitions for james were omitted but at st margaret's sharp dean of norwich who had been requested to preach before the commons not only read to their faces the whole service as it stood in the book but before his sermon implored in his own words a blessing on the king and towards the close of his discourse declaimed against the jesuitical doctrine that princes might lawfully be deposed by their subjects the speaker that very afternoon complained to the house of this affront you pass a vote one day he said and on the next day it is contradicted from the pulpit in your own hearing sharp was strenuously defended by the tories and had friends even among the whigs for it was not forgotten that he had incurred serious danger in the evil times by the courage with which in defiance of the royal injunction he had preached against popery sir christopher musgrave very ingeniously remarked that the house had not ordered the resolution which declared the throne vacant to be published sharp therefore was not only not bound to know anything of that resolution but could not have taken notice of it without a breach of privilege for which he might have been called to the bar and reprimanded on his knees the majority felt that it was not wise at that conjuncture to quarrel with the clergy and the subject was suffered to drop while the commons were discussing sharp's sermon the lords had again gone into a committee on the state of the nation and had ordered the resolution which pronounced the throne vacant to be read clause by clause the first expression on which a debate arose was that which recognized the original contract between king and people it was not to be expected 
that the Tory peers would suffer a phrase which contained the quintessence of Whiggism to pass unchallenged. A division took place, and it was determined by fifty-three votes to forty-six that the words should stand. The severe censure passed by the Commons on the administration of James was next considered, and was approved without one dissentient voice. Some verbal objections were made to the proposition that James had abdicated the government. It was urged that he might more correctly be said to have deserted it. This amendment was adopted, it should seem, with scarcely any debate, and without a division. By this time it was late, and the Lords again adjourned. Up to this moment the small body of peers, which was under the guidance of Danby, had acted in firm union with Halifax and the Whigs. The effect of this union had been that the plan of regency had been rejected, and the doctrine of the original contract affirmed. The proposition that James had ceased to be king had been the rallying point of the two parties which had made up the majority, but from that point their path diverged. The next question to be decided was whether the throne was vacant, and this was a question not merely verbal, but of grave practical importance. If the throne was vacant, the estates of the realm might place William in it. If it was not vacant, he could succeed to it only after his wife, after Anne, and after Anne's posterity. End of part ten. Chapter ten, part eleven. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of England from the Accession of James the Second by Thomas Babington Macaulay. Chapter ten, part eleven. It was, according to the followers of Danby, an established maxim that our country could not be, even for a moment, without a rightful prince. The man might die, but the magistrate was immortal. The man might abdicate, but the magistrate was irremovable. If, these politicians said, we once admit that the throne is vacant, we admit that it is elective. The sovereign whom we may place on it will be a sovereign not after the English, but after the Polish fashion. Even if we choose the very person who would reign by right of birth, still that person will reign not by right of birth, but in virtue of our choice, and will take as a gift what ought to be regarded as an inheritance. That salutary reverence with which the blood royal and the order of primogeniture have hitherto been regarded will be greatly diminished still more serious will the evil be if we not only fill the throne by election but fill it with a prince who has doubtless the qualities of a great and good ruler and who has wrought a wonderful deliverance for us but who is not first nor even second in the order of succession if we once say that merit however eminent shall be a title to the crown we disturb the very foundations of our polity and furnish a precedent of which every ambitious warrior or statesman who may have rendered any great service to the public will be tempted to avail himself. This danger we avoid if we logically follow out the principles of the Constitution to their consequences. There has been a demise of the Crown. At the instant of the demise the next heir becomes our lawful sovereign. We consider the Princess of Orange as next heir, and we hold that she ought without any delay to be proclaimed what she already is, our Queen. The Whigs replied that it was idle to apply ordinary rules to a country in a state of revolution, that the great question now depending was not to be decided by the sores of pedantic Templars, and that if it were to be so decided such sores might be quoted on one side as well as the other. If it were a legal maxim that the throne could never be vacant, it was also a legal maxim that a living man could have no heir. James was still living. How, then, could the Princess of Orange be his heir? The truth was that the laws of England had made full provision for the succession when the power of a sovereign and his natural life terminated together, but had made no provision for the very rare cases in which his power terminated before the close of his natural life. And with one of those very rare cases the Convention had now to deal. 
that James no longer filled the throne, both houses had pronounced. Neither common law nor statute law designated any person as entitled to fill the throne between his demise and his decease. It followed that the throne was vacant, and that the houses might invite the Prince of Orange to fill it. That he was not next in order of birth was true, but this was no disadvantage. On the contrary, it was a positive recommendation. Hereditary monarchy was a good political institution, but was by no means more sacred than other good political institutions. Unfortunately, bigoted and servile theologians had turned it into a religious mystery, almost as awful and as incomprehensible as transubstantiation itself. To keep the institution, and yet to get rid of the abject and noxious superstitions with which it had of late years been associated, and which had made it a curse instead of a blessing to society, ought to be the first object of English statesmen, and that object would be best attained by slightly deviating for a time from the general rule of dissent, and by then returning to it. Many attempts were made to prevent an open breach between the party of the prince and the party of the princess. A great meeting was held at the Earl of Devonshire's house, and the dispute was warm. Halifax was the chief speaker for William, Danby for Mary. Of the mind of Mary, Danby knew nothing. She had been some time expected in London, but had been detained in Holland, first by masses of ice which had blocked up the rivers, and, when the thaw came, by strong westerly winds. Had she arrived earlier, the dispute would probably have been at once quieted. Halifax, on the other side, had no authority to say anything in William's name. The Prince, true to his promise that he would leave the settlement of the government to the Convention, had maintained an impenetrable reserve, and had not suffered any word, look, or gesture, indicative either of satisfaction or of displeasure, to escape him. One of his countrymen, who had a large share of his confidence, had been invited to the meeting, and was earnestly pressed by the peers to give them some information. He long excused himself. At last he so far yielded to their urgency as to say, I can only guess at His Highness's mind. If you wish to know what I guess, I guess that he would not like to be his wife's gentleman usher. But I know nothing. I know something now, however, said Danby. I know enough, and too much. He then departed, and the assembly broke up. On the 31st of January the debate which had terminated thus in private was publicly renewed in the House of Peers. That day had been fixed for the national thanksgiving. An office had been drawn up for the occasion by several bishops, among whom were Ken and Spratt. It is perfectly free, both from the adulation and from the malignity by which such compositions were in that age too often deformed, and sustains, perhaps better than any occasional service which has been framed during two centuries, a comparison with that great model of chaste, lofty, and pathetic eloquence, the Book of Common Prayer. The Lords went in the morning to Westminster Abbey. The Commons had desired Burnet to preach before them at St. Margaret's. He was not likely to fall into the same error which had been committed in the same place on the preceding day. His vigorous and animated discourse doubtless called forth the loud hums of his auditors. It was not only printed by command of the house, but was translated into French for the edification of foreign Protestants. The day closed with the festivities usual on such occasions. The whole town shone brightly with fireworks and bonfires. The roar of guns and the pealing of bells lasted till the night was far spent. But before the lights were extinct, and the streets silent, an event had taken place which threw a damp on the public joy. The peers had repaired from the abbey to their house, and had resumed the discussion on the state of the nation. The last words of the resolution of the Commons were taken into consideration, and it soon became clear that the majority were not disposed to assent to those words. To near fifty lords who held that the regal title still belonged to James, were now added seven or eight who held that it had already devolved on Mary. The Whigs, finding themselves outnumbered, tried to compromise the dispute. They promised to omit the words which pronounced the throne vacant, and simply to declare the prince and princess king and queen. It was manifest that such a declaration implied, though it did not expressly affirm, all that the Tories were unwilling to concede. 
for nobody could pretend that William had succeeded to the regal office by right of birth. To pass a resolution acknowledging him as king was therefore an act of election, and how could there be an election without a vacancy? The proposition of the Whig lords was rejected by fifty-two votes to forty-seven. The question was then put whether the throne was vacant. The contents were only forty-one, the non-contents fifty-five, of the minority thirty-six protested. During the two following days London was in an unquiet and anxious state. The Tories began to hope that they might be able again to bring forward their favourite plan of regency with better success. Perhaps the Prince himself, when he found that he had no chance of wearing the crown, might prefer Sancroft's scheme to Danby's. It was better, doubtless, to be a king than to be a regent, but it was better to be a regent than to be a gentleman usher. On the other side, the lower and fiercer class of Whigs, the old emissaries of Shaftesbury, the old associates of college, began to stir in the city. Crowds assembled in Palace Yard and held threatening language. Lord Lovelace, who was suspected of having encouraged these assemblages, informed the peers that he was charged with a petition requesting them instantly to declare the Prince and Princess of Orange King and Queen. He was asked by whom the petition was signed. "'There are no hands to it yet,' he answered. "'But when I bring it here next there shall be hands enough.' This menace alarmed and disgusted his own party. The leading Whigs were, in truth, even more anxious than the Tories, that the deliberations of the Convention should be perfectly free, and that it should not be in the power of any adherent of James to allege that either House had acted under force. A petition, similar to that which had been entrusted to Lovelace, was brought into the House of Commons, but was contemptuously rejected. Maynard was foremost in protesting against the attempt of the rabble in the streets to overawe the estates of the realm. William sent for Lovelace, expostulated with him strongly, and ordered the magistrates to act with vigour against all unlawful assemblies. Nothing in the history of our revolution is more deserving of admiration and of imitation than the manner in which the two parties in the Convention, at the very moment at which their disputes ran highest, joined like one man to resist the dictation of the mob of the capital. But, though the Whigs were fully determined to maintain order and to respect the freedom of debate, they were equally determined to make no concession. On Saturday the 2nd of February the Commons, without a division, resolved to adhere to their resolution as it originally stood. James, as usual, came to the help of his enemies. A letter from him to the Convention had just arrived in London. It had been transmitted to Preston by the apostate Melfort, who was now high in favour at Saint-Germain. The name of Melfort was an abomination to every churchman. That he was still a confidential minister was alone sufficient to prove that his master's folly and perverseness were incurable. No member of either House ventured to propose that a paper which came from such a quarter should be read. The contents, however, were well known to all the town. His Majesty exhorted the Lords and Commons not to despair of his clemency, and graciously assured them that he would pardon those who had betrayed him, some few excepted, whom he did not name. How was it possible to do anything for a prince who, vanquished, deserted, banished, living on arms, told those who were the arbiters of his fate that, if they would set him on his throne again, he would hang only a few of them. End of Part 11 History of England, Chapter 10, Part 12 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of England from the Accession of James the Second by Thomas Babington Macaulay. Chapter 10, Part 12. The contest between the two branches of the legislature lasted some days longer. On Monday, the 4th of February, the peers resolved that they would insist on their amendments but a protest to which thirty-nine names were subscribed was entered on the journals. On the following day the Tories determined to try their strength in the lower house. 
they mustered there in great force. A motion was made to agree to the amendments of the Lords. Those who were for the plan of Sancroft, and those who were for the plan of Danby, divided together, but they were beaten by 282 votes to 151. The House then resolved to request a free conference with the Lords. At the same time, strenuous efforts were making without the walls of Parliament to bring the dispute between the two branches of the legislature to a close. Burnet thought that the importance of the crisis justified him in publishing the great secret which the Princess had confided to him. He knew, he said, from her own lips, that it had long been her full determination, even if she came to the throne in the regular course of descent, to surrender her power, with the sanction of Parliament, into the hand of her husband. Danby received from her an earnest and almost angry reprimand. She was, she wrote, the Prince's wife. She had no other wish than to be subject to him. The most cruel injury that could be done to her would be to set her up as his competitor, and she never could regard any person who took such a course as her true friend. The Tories had still one hope. Anne might insist on her own rights, and on those of her children. No effort was spared to stimulate her ambition and to alarm her conscience. Her uncle Clarendon was especially active. A few weeks only had elapsed since the hope of wealth and greatness had impelled him to belie the boastful professions of his whole life, to desert the royal cause, to join with the Wildmans and Fergusons, nay, to propose that the King should be sent a prisoner to a foreign land, and immured in a fortress begirt by pestilential marshes. The lure which had produced this strange transformation was the Viceroyalty of Ireland. Soon, however, it appeared that the proselyte had a little chance of obtaining the splendid prize on which his heart was set. He found that others were consulted on Irish affairs. His advice was never asked, and, when obtrusively and importunately offered, was coldly received. He repaired many times to St. James's Palace but could scarcely obtain a word or a look. One day the Prince was writing, another day he wanted fresh air and must ride in the park, on a third he was closeted with the officers on military business and could see nobody. Clarendon saw that he was not likely to gain anything by the sacrifice of his principles, and determined to take them back again. In December ambition had converted him into a rebel, in January disappointment reconverted him into a royalist. The uneasy consciousness that he had not been a consistent Tory gave a peculiar acrimony to his Toryism. In the House of Lords he had done all in his power to prevent a settlement. He now exerted, for the same end, all his influence over the Princess Anne. But his influence over her was small indeed when compared with that of the Churchills, who wisely called to their help two powerful allies, Tillotson, who was a spiritual director, had at that time immense authority, and Lady Russell, whose noble and gentle virtues, proved by the most cruel of all trials, had gained for her the reputation of a saint. The Princess of Denmark, it was soon known, was willing that William should reign for life, and it was evident that to defend the cause of the daughters of James against themselves was a hopeless task. And now William thought that the time had come when he ought to explain himself. He accordingly sent for Halifax, Danby, Shrewsbury, and some other political leaders of great note, and, with that air of stoical apathy under which he had from a boy been in the habit of concealing his strongest emotions, addressed to them a few deeply meditated and weighty words. He had hitherto, he said, remained silent. He had used neither solicitation nor menace. He had not even suffered a hint of his opinions or wishes to get abroad, but a crisis had now arrived at which it was necessary for him to declare his intentions. He had no right and no wish to dictate to the Convention. All that he claimed was the privilege of declining any office which he felt that he could not hold with honour to himself and with benefit to the public. A strong party was for a regency. It was for the Houses to determine whether such an arrangement would be for the interest of the nation. 
He had a decided opinion on that point, and he thought it right to say distinctly that he would not be regent. Another party was for placing the princess on the throne, and for giving to him during her life the title of king, and such a share in the administration as she might be pleased to allow him. He could not stoop to such a post. He esteemed the princess as much as it was possible for man to esteem woman, but not even from her would he accept a subordinate and a precarious place in the government. He was so made that he could not submit to be tied to the apron-strings even of the best of wives. He did not desire to take any part in English affairs, but if he did consent to take a part, there was one part only which he could usefully or honourably take. If the estates offered him the crown for life, he would accept it. If not, he should, without repining, return to his native country. He concluded by saying that he thought it reasonable that the Lady Anne and her posterity should be preferred in the succession to any children whom he might have by any other wife than the Lady Mary. The meeting broke up, and what the Prince had said was in a few hours known all over London. That he must be king was now clear. The only question was whether he should hold the regal dignity alone or conjointly with the Princess. Halifax and a few other politicians, who saw in a strong light the danger of dividing the supreme executive authority, thought it desirable that, during William's life, Mary should be only Queen Consort and a subject. But this arrangement, though much might doubtless be said for it in argument, shocked the general feeling even of those Englishmen who were most attached to the Prince. His wife had given an unprecedented proof of conjugal submission and affection, and the very least return that could be made to her would be to bestow on her the dignity of Queen Regnant. William Herbert, one of the most zealous of the Prince's adherents, was so much exasperated that he sprang out of the bed to which he was confined by gout, and vehemently declared that he would never have drawn a sword in His Highness's cause if he had foreseen that so shameful an arrangement would be made no person took the matter up so eagerly as Burnet. His blood boiled at the wrong done to his kind patroness. He expostulated vehemently with Bentinck, and begged to be permitted to resign the chaplainship. "'While I am His Highness's servant,' said the brave and honest divine, "'it would be unseemly in me to oppose any plan which may have his countenance. I therefore desire to be set free, that I may fight the princess's battle with every faculty that God has given me.' Bentinck prevailed on Burnet to defer an open declaration of hostilities till William's resolution should be distinctly known. In a few hours the scheme which had excited so much resentment was entirely given up and all those who considered James as no longer king were agreed as to the way in which the throne must be filled. William and Mary must be king and queen. The heads of both must appear together on the coin, writs must run in the names of both, both must enjoy all the personal dignities and immunities of royalty, but the administration, which could not be safely divided, must belong to William alone. And now the time arrived for the free conference between the houses. The bannagers for the lords, in their robes, took their seats along one side of the table in the painted chamber, but the crowd of members of the House of Commons on the other side was so great that the gentlemen who were to argue the question in vain tried to get through. It was not without much difficulty and long delay that the sergeant-at-arms was able to clear a passage. At length the discussion began. A full report of the speeches on both sides has come down to us. There are few students of history who have not taken up that report with eager curiosity, and laid it down with disappointment. The question between the houses was argued on both sides as a question of law. The objections which the Lords made to the resolution of the Commons were verbal and technical, and were met by verbal and technical answers. Summers vindicated the use of the word abdication by quotations from Grotius and Brissonius, Spigelius and Bartolus. When he was challenged to show any authority for the proposition that England could be without a sovereign, he produced the Parliament Roll of the year 1399, in which it was expressly set forth that the kingly office was vacant during the interval between the resignation of Richard II and the enthroning of Henry IV. 
the Lords replied by producing the Parliament roll of the first year of Edward the Fourth, from which it appeared that the record of 1399 had been solemnly annulled. They therefore maintained that the precedent on which Somers relied was no longer valid. Treby then came forth to Somers's assistance, and brought forth the Parliament roll of the first year of Henry the Seventh, which repealed the Act of Edward the Fourth, and consequently restored the validity of the record of 1399. After a colloquy of several hours, the disputants separated. The Lords assembled in their own house. It was well understood that they were about to yield, and that the conference had been a mere form. The friends of Mary had found that, by setting her up as her husband's rival, they had deeply displeased her. Some of the peers, who had formerly voted for a regency, had determined to absent themselves, or to support the resolution of the lower house. Their opinion, they said, was unchanged, but any government was better than no government, and the country could not bear a prolongation of this agony of suspense. Even Nottingham, who in the Painted Chamber had taken the lead against the Commons, declared that, though his own conscience would not suffer him to give way, he was glad that the consciences of other men were less squeamish. Several lords, who had not yet voted in the Convention, had been induced to attend. Lord Lexington, who had just hurried over from the Continent, the Earl of Lincoln, who was half mad, the Earl of Carlisle, who limped in on crutches, and the Bishop of Durham, who had been in hiding, and had intended to fly beyond sea, but had received an intimation that, if he would vote for the settling of the government, his conduct in the Ecclesiastical Commission should not be remembered against him. Danby, desirous to heal the schism which he had caused, exhorted the House in a speech distinguished by even more than his usual ability, not to persevere in a contest which might be fatal to the State. He was strenuously supported by Halifax. The spirit of the opposite party was quelled. When the question was put whether King James had abdicated the government, only three lords said not content. On the question of whether the throne was vacant, a division was demanded. The contents were sixty-two, the not contents forty-seven. It was immediately proposed, and carried without a division, that the Prince and Princess of Orange should be declared King and Queen of England. Nottingham then moved that the wording of the oaths of allegiance and supremacy should be altered in such a way that they might be conscientiously taken by persons who, like himself, disapproved of what the Convention had done, and yet fully purposed to be loyal and dutiful subjects of the new sovereigns. To this proposition no objection was made. Indeed, there can be little doubt that there was an understanding on the subject between the Whig leaders and those Tory lords whose votes had turned the scale on the last division. The new oaths were sent down to the Commons, together with the resolution that the Prince and Princess should be declared King and Queen. It was now known to whom the crown would be given. On what conditions it should be given still remained to be decided. The Commons had appointed a committee member to consider what steps it might be advisable to take, in order to secure law and liberty against the aggressions of future sovereigns, and the committee had made a report. This report recommended, first, that those great principles of the Constitution, which had been violated by the dethroned King, should be solemnly asserted, and secondly, that many new laws should be enacted, for the purpose of curbing the prerogative and purifying the administration of justice. Most of the suggestions of the committee were excellent, but it was utterly impossible that the Houses could, in a month or even in a year, deal properly with matters so numerous, so various, and so important. It was proposed, among other things, that the militia should be remodelled, that the power which the Sovereign possessed of proroguing and dissolving Parliaments should be restricted, that the duration of Parliaments should be limited, that the royal pardon should no longer be pleadable to a parliamentary impeachment, that toleration should be granted to Protestant dissenters, that the crime of high treason should be more precisely defined, that trials for high treason should be conducted in a manner more favourable to innocence, that the judges should hold their places for life, that the mode of appointing sheriffs should be altered, that juries should be nominated in such a way as might exclude partiality and corruption, that the practice of filing criminal informations in the King's bench should be abolished, that the Court of Chancery shall be reformed, that the fees of public functionaries shall be regulated, and that the law of quo warranto should be amended. 
It was evident that cautious and deliberate legislation on these subjects must be the work of more than one laborious session, and it was equally evident that hasty and crude legislation on subjects so grave could not but produce new grievances worse than those which it might remove. If the committee meant to give a list of the reforms which ought to be accomplished before the throne was filled, the list was absurdly long. If, on the other hand, the committee meant to give a list of all the reforms which the legislature would do well to make in proper season, the list was strangely imperfect. Indeed, as soon as the report had been read, member after member rose to suggest some addition. It was moved and carried that the selling of offices should be prohibited that the Habeas Corpus Act should be made more efficient, and that the law of Mandamus should be revised. One gentleman fell on the chimney-men, another on the excise-men, and the House resolved that the malpractices of both chimney-men and excise-men should be restrained. It is a most remarkable circumstance that, while the whole political, military, judicial and fiscal system of the kingdom was thus passed in review, not a single representative of the people proposed the repeal of the statute which subjected the press to a censorship. It was not yet understood, even by the most enlightened men, that the liberty of discussion is the chief safeguard of all other liberties. The House was greatly perplexed. Some orators vehemently said that too much time had already been lost, and that the government ought to be settled without the delay of a day. Society was unquiet, trade was languishing, the English colony in Ireland was in imminent danger of perishing, a foreign war was impending, the exiled king might in a few weeks be at Dublin with a French army, and from Dublin he might soon cross to Chester. Was it not insanity at such a crisis to leave the throne unfilled, and, while the very existence of Parliaments was in jeopardy, to waste the time in debating whether Parliaments should be prorogued by the Sovereign or by themselves? On the other side it was asked whether the Convention could think that it had fulfilled its mission by merely pulling down one prince and putting up another. Surely now or never was the time to secure public liberty by such fences as might effectually prevent the encroachments of prerogative. There was doubtless great weight in what was urged on both sides. The able chiefs of the Whig party, among whom Somers was fast rising to ascendancy, proposed a middle course. The House had, they said, two objects in view, which ought to be kept distinct. One object was to secure the old polity of the realm against illegal attacks. The other was to improve that polity by legal reforms. The former object might be attained by solemnly putting on record, in the resolution which called the new sovereigns to the throne, the claim of the English nation to its ancient franchises, so that the king might hold his crown, and the people their privileges by one and the same title deed. The latter object would require a whole volume of elaborate statutes. The former object might be attained in a day, the latter scarcely in five years. As to the former object, all parties were agreed. As to the latter, there were innumerable varieties of opinion. No member of either House would hesitate for a moment to vote that the King could not levy taxes without the consent of Parliament. But it would be hardly possible to frame any new law of procedure in cases of high treason, which would not give rise to long debate, and be condemned by some persons as unjust to the prisoner, and by others as unjust to the Crown. The business of an extraordinary convention of the estates of the realm was not to do the ordinary work of parliaments, to regulate the fees of masters in chancery, and to provide against the exactions of gougers, but to put right the great machine of government. When this had been done, it would be time to inquire what improvement our institutions needed, nor would anything be risked by delay, for no sovereign who reigned merely by the choice of the nation could long refuse his assent to any improvement which the nation, speaking through its representatives, demanded. On these grounds the Commons wisely determined to postpone all reforms till the ancient constitution of the kingdom should have been restored in all its parts, and forthwith to fill the throne without imposing on William and Mary any other obligation than that of governing according to the existing laws of England. 
in order that the questions which had been in dispute between the Stuarts and the nation might never again be stirred, it was determined that the instrument by which the Prince and Princess of Orange were called to the throne, and by which the order of succession was settled, should set forth, in the most distinct and solemn manner, the fundamental principles of the Constitution. The instrument, known by the name of the Declaration of Right, was prepared by a committee of which Summers was chairman. The fact that the low-born young barrister was appointed to so honourable and important a post, in a Parliament filled with able and experienced men, only ten days after he had spoken in the House of Commons for the first time, sufficiently proves the superiority of his abilities. In a few hours the Declaration was framed and approved by the Commons, the Lords assented to it, with some amendments, of no great importance. End of Part 12《History of England》Chapter 10 Part 13 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of England from the Accession of James the Second by Thomas Babington Macaulay. Chapter 10, Part 13. The Declaration began by recapitulating the crimes and errors which had made a revolution necessary. James had invaded the province of the legislature, had treated modest petitioning as a crime had oppressed the Church by means of an illegal tribunal, had, without the consent of Parliament, levied taxes and maintained a standing army in time of peace, had violated the freedom of election, and perverted the course of justice. Proceedings which could lawfully be questioned only in Parliament had been made the subjects of prosecution in the King's bench. Partial and corrupt juries had been returned, excessive bail had been required from prisoners, excessive fines had been imposed, barbarous and unusual punishments had been inflicted, the estates of accused persons had been granted away before conviction. He, by whose authority these things had been done, had abdicated the government. The Prince of Orange, whom God had made the glorious instrument of delivering the nation from superstition and tyranny, had invited the estates of the realm to meet and to take counsel together for the securing of religion, of law, and of freedom. The Lords and Commons, having deliberated, had resolved that they would, first, after the example of their ancestors, assert the ancient rights and liberties of England. Therefore it was declared that the dispensing power, lately assumed and exercised, had no legal existence, that, without grant of Parliament, no money could be extracted by the sovereign from the subject, that, without consent of Parliament, no standing army could be kept up in time of peace. The right of subjects to petition, the right of electors to choose representatives freely, the right of Parliaments to freedom of debate, the right of the nation to a pure and merciful administration of justice according to the spirit of its own mild laws, were solemnly affirmed. All these things the Convention claimed, in the name of the whole nation, as the undoubted inheritance of Englishmen. Having thus vindicated the principles of the Constitution, the Lords and Commons, in the entire confidence that the Deliverer would hold sacred the laws and liberties which he had saved, resolved that William and Mary, Prince and Princess of Orange, should be declared King and Queen of England for their joint and separate lives, and that, during their joint lives, the administration of the government should be in the prince alone. After them the crown was settled on the posterity of Mary, then on Anne and her posterity, and then on the posterity of William. By this time the wind had ceased to blow from the west. The ship in which the Princess of Orange had embarked lay off Margate on the 11th of February, and, on the following morning, anchored at Greenwich. She was received with many signs of joy and affection, but her demeanour shocked the Tories, and was not thought faultless even by the Whigs. A young woman, 
placed by a destiny as mournful and awful as that which had brooded over the fabled houses of Labdacus and Pelops, in such a situation that she could not, without violating her duty to her god, her husband, and her country, refuse to take her seat on the throne from which her father had just been hurled, should have been sad, or at least serious. Mary was not merely in high, but in extravagant spirits. She entered Whitehall, it was asserted, with a girlish delight at being mistress of so fine a house, ran about the rooms, peeped into the closets, and examined the quilt of the state bed, without seeming to remember by whom those magnificent apartments had last been occupied. Burnet, who had till then thought her an angel in human form, could not, on this occasion, refrain from blaming her. He was the more astonished, because, when he took leave of her at the Hague, she had, though fully convinced that she was in the path of duty, been deeply dejected. To him, as to her spiritual guide, she afterwards explained her conduct. William had written to inform her that some of those who had tried to separate her interest from his still continued their machinations. They gave it out that she thought herself wronged, and, if she wore a gloomy countenance, the report would be confirmed. He therefore entreated her to make her first appearance with an air of cheerfulness. Her heart, she said, was far indeed from cheerful, but she had done her best, and, as she was afraid of not sustaining well a part which was uncongenial to her feelings, she had overacted it. Her deportment was the subject of reams of scurrility in prose and verse. It lowered her in the opinion of some whose esteem she valued. Nor did the world know, till she was beyond the reach of praise and censure, that the conduct which had brought on her the reproach of levity and insensibility was really a signal instance of that perfect disinterestedness and self-devotion of which man seems to be incapable, but which is sometimes found in women. On the morning of Wednesday, the 13th of February, the court of Whitehall and all the neighbouring streets were filled with gazers. The magnificent banqueting-house, the masterpiece of Inigo, embellished by masterpieces of Rubens, had been prepared for a great ceremony. The walls were lined by the yeomen of the guard. Near the northern door, on the right hand, a large number of peers had assembled. On the left were the commons, with their speaker attended by the mace. The southern door opened and the Prince and Princess of Orange, side by side, entered, and took their place under the canopy of state. Both houses approached, bowing low. William and Mary advanced a few steps. Halifax on the right, and Pole on the left, stood forth, and Halifax spoke. The Convention, he said, had agreed to a resolution which he prayed their Highnesses to hear, they signified their assent, and the clerk of the House of Lords read in a loud voice the Declaration of Right. When he had concluded, Halifax, in the name of all the estates of the realm, requested the Prince and Princess to accept the crown. William, in his own name and in that of his wife, answered that the crown was, in their estimation, the more valuable because it was presented to them as a token of the confidence of the nation. We thankfully accept, he said, what you have offered us. Then, for himself, he assured them that the laws of England, which he had once already vindicated, should be the rules of his conduct, that it should be his study to promote the welfare of the kingdom, and that, as to the means of doing so, he should constantly recur to the advice of the houses, and should be disposed to trust their judgment rather than his own. These words were received with a shout of joy which was heard in the streets below, and was instantly answered by huzzas from many thousands of voices. The lords and commons then reverently retired from the banqueting-house, and went in procession to the great gate of Whitehall, where the heralds and pursuivants were waiting in their gorgeous tabards. All the space, as far as Charing Cross, was one sea of heads. The kettle-drums struck up, the trumpets pealed, and Garter King at Arms, in a loud voice, proclaimed the Prince and Princess of Orange, King and Queen of England, charged all Englishmen to pay from that moment faith and true allegiance to the new sovereigns, and besought God, 
who had already wrought so signal a deliverance for our church and nation, to bless William and Mary with a long and happy reign. Thus was consummated the English Revolution. When we compare it with those revolutions which have, during the last sixty years, overthrown so many ancient governments, we cannot but be struck by its peculiar character. Why that character was so peculiar is sufficiently obvious, and yet seems not to have been always understood either by eulogists or by censors. The continental revolutions of the eighteenth and nineteenth centuries took place in countries where all trace of the limited monarchy of the Middle Ages had long been effaced. The right of the prince to make laws and to levy money had, during many generations, been undisputed. His throne was guarded by a great regular army. His administration could not, without extreme peril, be blamed even in the mildest terms. His subjects held their personal liberty by no other tenure than his pleasure. Not a single institution was left which had, within the memory of the oldest man, afforded efficient protection to the subject against the utmost excess of tyranny. Those great councils which had once curbed the regal power had sunk into oblivion. Their composition and their privileges were known only to antiquaries. We cannot wonder, therefore, that when men who had been thus ruled succeeded in wresting supreme power from a government which they had long in secret hated, they should have been impatient to demolish and unable to construct, that they should have been fascinated by every specious novelty, that they should have prescribed every title, ceremony, and phrase associated with the old system, and that, turning away with disgust from their own national precedents and traditions, they should have sought for principles of government in the writings of theorists, or aped, with ignorant and ungraceful affectation, the patriots of Athens and Rome. As little can we wonder that the violent action of the revolutionary spirit should have been followed by reaction equally violent and that confusion should speedily have engendered despotism sterner than that from which it had sprung. Had we been in the same situation, had Strafford succeeded in his favourite scheme of thorough, had he formed an army as numerous and as well disciplined as that which a few years later was formed by Cromwell, had a series of judicial decisions similar to that which was pronounced by the Exchequer Chamber in the case of ship money, transferred to the Crown the right of taxing the people, had the Star Chamber and the High Commission continued to fine, mutilate, and imprison every man who dared raise his voice against the government, had the press been as completely enslaved here as at Vienna or at Naples, had our kings gradually drawn to themselves the whole legislative power, had six generations of Englishmen passed away without a single session of Parliament, and had we then at length risen up in some moment of wild excitement against our masters, what an outbreak would that have been! With what a crash, heard and felt to the farthest ends of the world, would the whole vast fabric of society have fallen! How many thousands of exiles! once the most prosperous and the most refined members of this great community, would have begged their bread in continental cities, or have sheltered their heads under huts of bark in the uncleared forests of America. How often should we have seen the pavement of London piled up in barricades, the houses dinted with bullets, the gutters foaming with blood! How many times should we have rushed wildly from extreme to extreme, sought refuge from anarchy in despotism, and been driven again by despotism into anarchy? How many years of blood and confusion would it have cost us to learn the very rudiments of political science? How many childish theories would have duped us? How many rude and ill-poised constitutions should we have set up only to see them tumble down? Happy would it have been for us, if a sharp discipline of half a century had sufficed to educate us into a capacity of enjoying true freedom. These calamities our revolution averted. It was a revolution strictly defensive, and had prescription and legitimacy on its side. Here, and here only, a limited monarchy of the thirteenth century had come down unimpaired to the seventeenth century. Our parliamentary institutions were in full vigour. The main principles of our government were excellent. 
They were not, indeed, formally and exactly set forth in a single written instrument, but they were to be found scattered over our ancient and noble statutes, and, what was of far greater moment, they had been engraven on the hearts of Englishmen during four hundred years. That, without the consent of the representatives of the nation, no legislative act could be passed, no tax imposed, no regular soldiery kept up, that no man could be imprisoned, even for a day, by the arbitrary will of the sovereign, that no tool of power could plead the royal command as a justification for violating any right of the humblest subject, were held both by Whigs and Tories to be fundamental laws of the realm. A realm of which these were the fundamental laws stood in no need of a new constitution. But, though a new constitution was not needed, it was plain that changes were required. The misgovernment of the Stuarts, and the troubles which that misgovernment had produced, sufficiently proved that there was somewhere a defect in our polity, and that defect it was the duty of the Convention to discover and to supply. Some questions of great moment were still open to dispute. Our Constitution had begun to exist in times when statesmen were not much accustomed to frame exact definitions. Anomalies, therefore, inconsistent with its principles, and dangerous to its very existence, had sprung up almost imperceptibly, and, not having during many years caused any serious inconvenience, had gradually acquired the force of prescription. The remedy for these evils was to assert the rights of the people, in such language as should terminate all controversy, and to declare that no precedent could justify any violation of these rights. When this had been done it would be impossible for our rulers to misunderstand the law, but, unless something more were done, it was by no means improbable that they might violate it. Unhappily the Church had long taught the nation that hereditary monarchy, alone among our institutions, was divine and inviolable, that the right of the House of Commons to a share in the legislative power was a right merely human, but that the right of the King to the obedience of his people was from above, that the Great Charter was a statute which might be repealed by those who had made it, but that the rule which called the princes of the blood royal to the throne in order of succession was of celestial origin, and that any act of Parliament inconsistent with that rule was a nullity. It is evident, then, in a society in which such superstitions prevail, constitutional freedom must ever be insecure. A power which is regarded merely as the ordinance of man cannot be an efficient check on a power which is regarded as the ordinance of God. It is vain to hope that laws, however excellent, will permanently restrain a king who, in his own opinion, and in that of a great part of his people, has an authority infinitely higher in kind than the authority which belongs to those laws. To deprive royalty of these mysterious attributes, and to establish the principle that kings reigned by a right in no respect differing from the right by which freeholders chose knights of the shire, or from the right by which judges granted writs of habeas corpus, was absolutely necessary to the security of our liberties. Thus, the Convention had two great duties to perform. The first was to clear the fundamental laws of the realm from ambiguity. The second was to eradicate from the minds, both of the governors and of the governed, the false and pernicious notion that the royal prerogative was something more sublime and holy than those fundamental laws. The former object was attained by the solemn recital and claim with which the Declaration of Right commences, the latter by the resolution which pronounced the throne vacant, and invited William and Mary to fill it. The change seems small. Not a single flower of the crown was touched. Not a single new right was given to the people. The whole English law, substantive and adjective, was, in the judgment of all the greatest lawyers of Holt, and Treby of Maynard and Summers, exactly the same after the Revolution as before it. Some controverted points had been decided according to the sense of the best jurists, and there had been a slight deviation from the ordinary course of succession. This was all, and this was enough. 
As our revolution was a vindication of ancient rights, so it was conducted with strict attention to ancient formalities. In almost every word and act may be discerned a profound reverence for the past. The estates of the realm deliberated in the old halls and according to the old rules. Powell was conducted to his chair between his mover and his seconder with the accustomed forms. The sergeant with his mace brought up the messengers of the lords to the table of the commons, and the three obeisances were duly made. The conference was held with all the antique ceremonial. On one side of the table, in the painted chamber, the managers of the lords sat covered and robed in ermine and gold. The managers of the commons stood bareheaded on the other side. The speeches present an almost ludicrous contrast to the revolutionary oratory of every other country. Both the English parties agreed in treating with solemn respect the ancient constitutional traditions of the state. The only question was in what sense those traditions were to be understood. The asserters of liberty said not a word about the natural equality of men and the inalienable sovereignty of the people, about Harmodius or Timoleon, Brutus the Elder or Brutus the Younger. When they were told that, by the English law, the crown, at the moment of a demise, must descend to the next heir, they answered that, by the English law, a living man could have no heir. When they were told that there was no precedent for declaring the throne vacant, they produced from among the records in the tower a roll of parchment, near three hundred years old, on which, in quaint characters and barbarous Latin, it was recorded that the estates of the realm had declared vacant the throne of a perfidious and tyrannical Plantagenet. When, at length, the dispute had been accommodated, the new sovereigns were proclaimed with the old pageantry. All the fantastic pomp of heraldry was there. Clarencieux and Noroy, Portcullis and Rouge Dragon, the trumpets, the banners, the grotesque coats embroidered with lions and lilies. The title of King of France, assumed by the conqueror of Cressy, was not omitted in the royal style. To us, who have lived in the year 1848, it may seem almost an abuse of terms to call a proceeding, conducted with so much deliberation, with so much sobriety, and with such minute attention to prescriptive etiquette, by the terrible name of revolution. And yet, this revolution, of all revolutions the least violent, has been of all revolutions the most beneficent. It finally decided the great question whether the popular element which had, ever since the age of Fitzwalter and de Montfort, been found in the English polity, should be destroyed by the monarchical element, or should be suffered to develop itself freely, and to become dominant. The strife between the two principles had been long, fierce, and doubtful. It had lasted through four reigns. It had produced seditions, impeachments, rebellions, battles, sieges, prescriptions, judicial massacres. Sometimes liberty, sometimes royalty, had seemed to be on the point of perishing. During many years, one half of the energy of England had been employed in counteracting the other half. The executive power and the legislative power had so effectually impeded each other that the state had been of no account in Europe. The King at Arms, who proclaimed William and Mary before Whitehall Gate, did in truth announce that this great struggle was over, that there was entire union between the throne and the Parliament, that England, long dependent and degraded, was again a power of the first rank, that the ancient laws by which the prerogative was bounded would henceforth be held as sacred as the prerogative itself, and would be followed out to all their consequences, that the executive administration would be conducted in conformity with the sense of the representatives of the nation, and that no reform, which the two houses should, after mature deliberation, propose, would be obstinately withstood by the sovereign. The Declaration of Right, though it made nothing law which had not been law before, contained the germ of the law which gave religious freedom to the dissenter, of the law which secured the independence of the judges, of the law which limited the duration of parliaments, of the law which placed the liberty of the press under the protection of juries, of the law which prohibited the slave trade, of the law which abolished the sacramental test 
of the law which relieved the Roman Catholics from civil disabilities, of the law which reformed the representative system, of every good law which has been passed during a hundred and sixty years, of every good law which may hereafter, in the course of ages, be found necessary to promote the public weal, and to satisfy the demands of public opinion. The highest eulogy which can be pronounced on the revolution of 1688 is this, that it was our last revolution. Several generations have now passed away since any wise and patriotic Englishman has meditated resistance to the established government. In all honest and reflecting minds there is a conviction, daily strengthened by experience, that the means of effecting every improvement which the Constitution requires may be found within the Constitution itself. Now, if ever, we ought to be able to appreciate the whole importance of the stand which was made by our forefathers against the House of Stuart. All around us the world is convulsed by the agonies of great nations. Governments which seemed likely to stand during ages have been on a sudden shaken and overthrown. The proudest capitals of Western Europe have streamed with civil blood. All evil passions, the thirst of gain and the thirst of vengeance, the antipathy of class to class, the antipathy of race to race, have broken loose from the control of divine and human laws. Fear and anxiety have clouded the faces and depressed the hearts of millions. Trade has been suspended and industry paralysed. The rich have become poor, and the poor have become poorer doctrines hostile to all sciences, to all arts, to all industry, to all domestic charities, doctrines which, if carried into effect, would in thirty years undo all that thirty centuries have done for mankind, and would make the fairest provinces of France and Germany as savage as Congo or Patagonia, have been avowed from the tribute and defended by the sword. Europe has been threatened with subjugation by barbarians compared with whom the barbarians who marched under Attila and Alboin were enlightened and humane. The truest friends of the people have, with deep sorrow, owned that interests more precious than any political privileges were in jeopardy, and that it might be necessary to sacrifice even liberty in order to save civilization. Meanwhile, in our island, the regular course of government has never been for a day interrupted. The few bad men who longed for license and plunder have not had the courage to confront for one moment the strength of a loyal nation, rallied in firm array around a parental throne. And, if it be asked what has made us to differ from others, the answer is that we never lost what others are wildly and blindly seeking to regain. It is because we had a preserving revolution in the seventeenth century that we have not had a destroying revolution in the nineteenth. It is because we had freedom in the midst of servitude that we have order in the midst of anarchy. For the authority of law, for the security of property, for the peace of our streets, for the happiness of our houses, our gratitude is due under him who raises and pulls down nations at his pleasure, to the long Parliament, to the Convention, and to William of Orange. End of Part 13 And the end of Book 2 and Chapter 10 of The History of England by Thomas Babington Macaulay